Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Joey Grover. I'm the medical director for Orange County Emergency Services. I'm going to be talking today about nitrous oxide and its use for pain control at the EMT level. So for those of you unaware, um, we actually in 2023 advanced the scope of practice of our EMTs to include nitrous oxide, um, which is really exciting because it's been an alternative for pain control at the paramedic level previously, but never advanced at the EMT level. And one of the reasons it's really exciting is that that's a, it's a highly effective analgesic um, that actually works at multiple different levels. So it doesn't just provide for pain control, but it actually is associated with improvement in anxiety. Um, and interestingly, um, has been used um, for hundreds of years. So for those of you unaware, it has been an alternative, especially in the dental world um, for pain control for a while. Um, what's also really cool, I think, from the pre-hospital side is that it can actually be self-administered. And so one of the things that we can do is really empower patients to be able to titrate their own pain control medication by using nitrous oxide. Interestingly, there's not a lot of options for how you administer it. So currently, there's only one system that exists in the pre-hospital side called Nitronox to be able to administer nitrous oxide in the pre-hospital setting. It's a relatively simple to use system that um, combines an oxygen cylinder with the nitrous to generate a 50-50 blend. So 50% nitrous, 50% oxygen. Now, if you all remember, right, a standard air only has 21% oxygen. And the idea being that if you give too much nitrous, you could actually induce some degree of hypoxia. And so the hope is by using a mix of 50-50 that it doesn't cause any of the issues associated with hypoxia that you might see at some of the higher blends. So a lot of times when you're talking about um, hospital nitrous administration or dental clinic administration, where it's being used more for a kind of almost like a procedural sedation, they're gonna be using a higher concentration blend. So that 70, 30 blend, where we're only going to be using a 50, 50 blend. And that's really kind of been the standard from a pre-hospital setting nationwide. So how does it work? So interesting, it seems to work similar to our opiate receptor um, by hitting at that mu opiate receptor um, uh, binding site. And so similar to the fentanyl and other medications that we use that hit at that opiate receptor, it seems to provide pretty comparable pain control. It also seems to hit at the GABA receptor, which as you guys might remember, is the receptor that we use for things um, like Versed. Um, so as an anxiolytic medication, a medication that decreases anxiety. And what's really interesting about pain is that part of the pain sensation actually does have an anxiety component, right? So if you have a hip fracture, and you know that it hurts every time you move your leg, a lot of times you tighten up and you can induce pain where it didn't exist previously before you thought that it was gonna get moved. And so by providing for both kind of that analgesic and anxiolytic effect, it actually works potentially even stronger than what we would otherwise be gaining in terms of benefit by just giving an opiate like fentanyl. So the question of course is, does it work in the pre-hospital side? And the answer is it does. So a lot of times, um, a number of systems across the country have actually uh, already rolled out nitrous oxide for the paramedic level. And what they found is that it's pretty similar in overall pain control to the standard uh, uh, opiate medications that we administer. And so for that reason, um, most recently, a evidence-based guideline came out looking at pre-hospital pain medications, and they were actually not able to make a rec recommendation between nitrous oxide and IV opiates because all of the data basically showed the two were comparable. And so what's really exciting about this, especially at the EMT level, is we are rolling out a pain medication that is what I would say as non-inferior or equivalent in terms of its effect as the IV opiates that we traditionally give for those patients at the ALS level. So once again, the real question is, is why are we using the 50-50 blend? And I hopefully have already addressed this. The 50-50 blend is given because it's easier to manage and not associated with the drop in oxygen level that you sometimes see at that higher concentration level like the 70-30. We don't wanna cause respiratory depression. We don't wanna cause any real true alteration in mental status. We don't wanna drop your oxygen saturation. And so for that reason, in the pre-hospital setting, 50% nitrous, 50% uh, oxygen is the traditional modality used. And as I mentioned before, um, this is not a new thing. So this paper that I'm showing right here um, was actually uh, published in 2005, so almost 20 years ago, basically showing it was safe and effective. What they also found is that it did have a little bit of a shorter duration in action. So it may be that a patient who gets good effect 
from the nitrous oxide by self-administering, you may have to re-administer earlier than if you were just giving an opiate medication. So they found that the recovery time was a lot shorter with nitrous compared to the patients who were getting the IV opiates. So what are the key points about nitrous? I would argue that it's similar in effect to the standard opiates that we give. So we're basically adding a medication at the BLS level that is comparable to the ALS intervention and that it is highly safe. So what are some of the requirements for it? So the first thing is that it's self-administered. So if a patient is unable to hold up the mask to their face, they are not eligible for this pain medication. They also have to be able to titrate it to effect, right? So they don't need a, any alteration in mental status. If they are not able to tell you anything about what's going on or describe the pain or anything along those lines, then we don't necessarily assume that they're gonna be able to titrate to effect. So once again, um, a normal mental status to be able to tolerate this medication is necessary. And once again, you know, why are we using the 50-50? We've talked about this multiple times. We don't want to cause drops in oxygen. We don't want to cause any changes in their respiratory status. And that's why that's the standard of care. So I do want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the contraindications. The first thing that I, I think is really important to think about from a physiologic perspective is the pneumothorax. So if there is air where there should not be air in your body, nitrogen is going to follow suit and expand that airspace. So for that reason, if a patient has a pneumothorax, by giving them nitrous oxide, you could actually cause an expansion of that pneumothorax. So that would be, if there was a patient that we were concerned about pneumothorax, we would not recommend administering nitrous oxide. Pregnancy is an interesting one. So there is concern, especially in first trimester pregnancy, that it could cause birth defects. Now, interestingly, some places administer nitrous oxide in childbirth. And the reason is, is because by that point, the child is fully cooked. The, the development is already, you know, completed. And so the thought is that you can't really induce any sort of birth defect in, in a child. The problem with giving a medication that you don't have an answer about its safety in pregnancy is that it could be unsafe. We don't know for sure. It is extremely hard to do a clinical trial from a safety perspective on pregnant patients because you have to follow them for 18 years to make sure that that baby develops and, you know, it, and is completely normal. So for that reason, you know, do I believe it's actually safe in like a third trimester setting? Probably. The answer in our system is that we are not going to administer nitrous oxide for childbirth for the very reason that it isn't FDA approved because of that safety question. Hypotension. Um, is interesting because it can cause a little bit of a drop in that blood pressure. So if a patient is hypotensive, we're not going to be administering this medication. The last one when we think about is abdominal pain. So when we think about small bowel obstructions, why do we worry about giving nitrous oxide there? It follows the same reason as the pneumothorax. So when you have a small bowel obstruction, air starts to build up. You get bowel distension because things are not passing through, and you can actually cause further bowel distension and even perforation. So for that reason, we are not going to use nitrous oxide for abdominal pain because we can't, you know, rule out a bowel obstruction in the pre-hospital setting. So really what we're getting to is that this is really only going to be used for musculoskeletal acute traumatic pain. Dosing is easy. So you titrate to effect. It's self-administered. It's at that 50-50 blend. This is what the protocol is going to look like. You can see that it finally offers us an option for acute traumatic musculoskeletal pain at the EMT level that I would say is comparable in that moderate to severe category. So it's the first time we're rolling out a true pain intervention at the BLS level for moderate to severe pain. And as I showed you in the previous clinical guidelines, I would argue that it is actually just as effective as giving an opiate. So what's the overall summary? The big summary is that we're finally going to roll out a pain medication that is equivalent to opiates for an EMT level in that moderate to severe pain category. I would argue that this is a huge advancement in terms of our scope of practice for EMTs to be able to treat, treat acute traumatic pain. And I would argue, you know, there are plenty of austere settings where it could be beneficial as well, right? If you have a patient who's say, got a prolonged extrication, this may be a good medication to address their pain during that prolonged extrication, right, where it isn't going to be associated with respiratory depression. Um, it could be potentially beneficial in rural settings where you have longer response times because you're able to offer a pain for moderate to severe pain before an ALS provider can get there to administer opiates. 
Um, I think there's a lot of potential for this medication, and I'm really excited for it to be rolling out in Orange County. So with that, I, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, but once again, we are very excited to roll out nitrous oxide for the EMT level for Orange County Emergency Services. Thank you so much.